Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to deliver this uh, keynote address. Today, I want to talk about hope. Hope as a political act, hope as a collective practice, hope as the political militancy of a community. How do we cultivate, nurture, and practice hope collectively? It is a tough historical time to find sources of hope or reasons to be hopeful. A quick look at my own immediate emotional geography is disheartening to say the least. Half of the population in Afghanistan is cut off from public life and condemned to live in the shadows. In Italy, we are told that we should rejoice because we finally have our first female prime minister. But she's a neo-fascist politician whose moral compass is geared towards a deeply bigoted, bigoted uh, heteronormativity. India is a hellhole of violent authoritarianism and ethno-nationalism. Kashmir and Palestine are in the grips of a constant assault of relentless settler colonialist powers. The Mediterranean has become the largest expanse of unmarked graves. This list is grim, and it is only just a superficial and cursory look at a portion of the world that I'm familiar with. So where do we go from here? Allow me to, deep, to delve a little deeper into this darkness. We need to look at it closely in the eye. We need to know its functioning mechanisms in order to be able to work for its undoing. The current wave of right-wing populism is vicious. It is all-encompassing, sly, and insidious. It is an incredible force to reckon with and irrespective of very different contexts, it works in remarkably similar ways. An example across continents is the infiltration into education. Somewhere in Florida in March, a sixth grade artistry teacher was made to resign for having shown a photo of Michelangelo's David because parents, according to NPR, uh, complained and equated it to exposing children to pornographic material. In India, as we speak, school books are being purged of Mughal history and references to Hindu extremism is, are being removed. Again, in the US, the index of banned books grows longer by the day. In Italy, ultra-conservative Catholics have been vocal in opposing the teaching of gender studies because they consider it dangerous for young minds and a way to encourage depravity. The assault on education goes hand in hand with historical revisionism and an expansive use of biopolitics to achieve a pervasive control over our bodies and souls. In the sense, another poignant example in the obsession with control is the obsession with control over the female body and the right of self-determination. Even though they are wrapped in seeming, seemingly opposite rhetorics, the vicious arguments around the right to veil, the imposition of the burqa, love jihad, honor killing, and the revocation of the right to abortion are all rooted in the same kind of biopolitical bigotry undermining agency, and in particular female agency, is a distinctive trait of all authoritarian regimes. In fact, for populism to work, we need to look, think, act, and behave, all in the same way, all according to the same norms, following the rules, conforming, obeying. The logic of sameness is imposed with a strategy that works on several complementary tracks. While it promotes through policies and with the help of a complacent media, a set of values that are defined as normal, it progressively pushes to the margins anything that may appear as a deviation from this norm. This exclusion is performed with the help of a malign use of language that floods the public domain with a vocabulary that demonizes otherness. The strength of populism is its capability to use simple words to instill and perpetuate fear, to brew paranoia and to cash political points and obedience from this edgy atmosphere. As they fabricate enemies and emergencies by appealing to the most primal instincts, populist regimes demand and obtain loyalty.
Here, it seems that we've come for full circle. We've reached a dead end, a cul-de-sac with no way out. We are back to the beginning, back to the initial question. What lays ahead? How do we cultivate, nurture, and practice hope collectively? It takes immense courage to be hopeful, hopeful at this point in history. But this is not a call for heroes. I find hyping ordinary goodness as heroism just as bad as fabricating enemies. Doctors are heroes. Firefighters are heroes. Activists are heroes. No, they are not. They're just good people who put their heads down and wake up every day doing what they're meant to do and doing it properly. Singling out act of, act of heroism only plays into hedonistic individualism and unmoors communities. Suchitra so Vijayan and I have been working for a couple of years on a book on Indian political prisoners. The title is How Long Can the Moon Be Caged? Voices of Indian Political Prisoners, and it will come out in August. For this book, we spent time with families of political prisoners and former political prisoners uh, themselves. A common feeling was the uneasiness that they felt at being turned into symbols, icons, in other words, in being turned into heroes. We were told time and again, this is not about me. This is about our struggle. This is not about me. This is about the cause we are fighting for. To be clear, I'm not talking about self-effacement here. I'm talking about moral clarity. This is why I'm, take, I'm saying that it takes courage to practice hope because it is a selfless act of community that is not intended to make you viral on social media. Bell Hooks, All About Love, New Visions, is a collection of short essays and musings around the different kinds of love that are part of our existence, from rom romantic love to care and friendship and family. While discussing a lesser individualistic understanding of love, she reminds us that, and I quote here, talking together is one way to make community. I am appealing here to this togetherness as a source of hope. I am advocating for a solidarity that overcomes the insularity and divisiveness of both liberal and conservative identity politics. In times where diversity is under physical, intellectual, and moral assault, this togetherness is at the same time a tool and a name, something to aspire to, as well as something that makes you, uh, something to make use of to counter hatred and produce sustainable counter narratives. This is why I fully embrace the philosophy of uh, Paulo Freire. In Pedagogy of Hope, he encourages us to teach hope. Hope is not a given. It needs to be actively nurtured and practiced and for it to be possible, it can only be done together. This invitation then becomes an, a duty and a responsibility, not just for teachers and educators, but for editors, publishers, cultural practitioners, activists, community organizers. To teach hope means to keep it alive, to pass it on to younger generations, to create welcoming spaces of togetherness that selflessly set aside the frustrations and bitterness of years of tough fights. Hope as a political act, as the political militancy of a community, thus becomes an ethical commitment, a commitment that becomes a collective pledge to hospitality, to transversal and unlabeled solidarity. Thank you.